forth than, than, than we've run across paths before. So what I wanted to do is just go over some of the basics with everybody here, because I know we have a lot of students in here as well that have never come across this topic before. And it's, it's kind of a nice refresher to go back through a little bit. But I just want to give it an overview of things. I've kind of broken this down into three different areas for you. One is going to be just giving you a little bit of the etiology of, of, uh, of Rabdo, the, the history, you know, how it's come about and so forth, and how we now see it in our modern times and how we contend with it in the world of athletics uh, specifically. And then if we have a little time, I'll give you a case study on one of, uh, one of your own, uh, an athletic training uh, student, now an athletic trainer in El Paso who experienced it personally and it took him out for about six months. It became pretty catastrophic in his life uh, as such. And then if there's a little more time, the third section will be a quiz. <laughs> Because we always have to have a quiz. All right. So I saw I saw your uh, I saw your your uh, slide that you sent out to everybody, and I thought I'd bring this up because it was kind of interesting. Because it, it has a flashback. Anybody kiss a camel before you? No. No. Well, in in 1990 when I was in the Gulf War with the Marine Corps, um, I did kiss a camel that was over there. So it just kind of reminded me of those days. You know, when we find camels out in the middle of the desert. It was, uh, it was, uh, we were out there, and there, you can see in the background there's nothing else in uh, Iraq and Saudi Arabia, nothing except camels. So, uh, so that, that, that yeah, kind of reminded me of those days. <laughs> so anyway, let me just kind of go over a brief history, because believe it or not, there is a history with Rabdo. It does go back a long, long ways. Rabdo is not something that's new uh, in, in, this, uh, in this world. They can, they can actually trace it back to eating quail. Uh, eating quail, shooting quail, there's a certain chemical in quail structure that can actually lead to rhabdo uh, as such. And they saw it during a, a plague, the Israeli, uh, Israelites and so forth, they've seen it all the way back in Egypt, and we, we can track it. So it's pretty interesting that it's not something new. Uh, where they really first started documenting all this was in back in the early 1900s, and especially in earthquakes, because crushing injuries. You and I get crushed by something very heavy, walls falling down. Uh, war was the big one because of all the, the conflict and, and blowing up the buildings, buildings falling on people. That's where they really saw the, the injuries at first. And then we can, we can see the, the first cases of acute renal failure uh, as we went through this crushing syndrome. We went into World War II, in the 1940s, they got even larger with all the bombing that was going on in Europe and so forth. So it, it, it continued to go through. And so people start actual research on to find out what's going on with the human body with all of the, the crushing injuries and, and how do we deal with this and what can we do with it. And unfortunately, a lot of it became lethal because we just didn't know how to work with it. So they literally crush rabbits and crush muscle tissue in rabbits as experiments to see what would happen with myoglobin and some of the internal components of cells. Uh, to, to see if there's a way to work through the whole rhabdo process as such. If we get to the 1950s and 60s, it started to continue even more as far as our knowledge base uh, came, as we started seeing more of this. A lot of this would occur again in military situations we'd see, especially in training, boot camps, people being pushed too hard, too fast. Uh, so we saw a lot of that occurring where, where more and more documentation would come out from taking someone who doesn't do much and then just you know, uh, it's all or nothing type mentality you would see, and that's what would lead to some of these things. So let's define it for everybody so we do know what rhabdomyolysis is. And, and in simplest form, you take skeletal muscle or striated tissue and you basically destroy it. All right, you destroy the membrane that surrounds it, the sarcoma, the membrane that surrounds the tissue. And think of that membrane as we, we talk about, for those of you who have had in different class, think of it like the, the walls, floor, and the ceiling of this room. It's a giant cell. And that's what's keeping this room integrity as we sit in this room right now. So when you destroy that membrane, everything inside, if you and I are the constituents inside the cell, we leak out. And we don't need to leak out to get into the bloodstream. Then the kidneys have to filtrate this process out. And that's where we start running the kidney failure this way. And so when we look at this, I'll give you, I'm going to give you several causes that you might run into that's out there. Trauma, of course, is the big one. If you look at football, for example, impact sports can be a big traumatic injury. But car accidents, uh, things like that are definitely up there. And, and again, the falling or the crushing the buildings, you see it. A lot of people don't realize that if you mobilize somebody for too long in a non-moving position, you can also leave that way, where a person sits in one place, uh, uh, and doesn't move. So here's an example of you know your your, your classic uh, an alcoholic, for example, passes out on the concrete, is there for 24 hours in a non-moving position on a hard surface, decreasing blood flow, and in turn then uh, we end up with rhabdo. So uh, or college students that drink too much and you know they pass out, the same thing happens. We see that. Uh, we see it with elderly, someone there in too too long a position, seizures that put a person into a mobilized state. 
Uh, and oftentimes we see it in surgical settings. So if you get a, a surgical setting where a, a surgeon's there and suddenly have to do a 16 or 18 hour surgery because of a massive, a massive auto accident, for example, and you're sitting on that stainless steel table and you're not moving the patient and so forth, the decreased blood flow to that, that tissue can actually lead to this. So it doesn't have to be an impact. It can be a mobile, uh, uh, an immobile situation. Uh, torture, we definitely see that. Now again, that would be more like POW camps and, and things like this. We definitely see those kinds of things uh, occurring. Long-term confinement, uh, we see this again. A lot of it's really come from military background in, this, in those types of situations. So a lot of it in Vietnam, when they put people in these small little uh, crates and leave them there for weeks or months at a time, that lack of movement and confinement. Besides the insanity aspect, we'd also see physical degradation, which is irreparable in those situations. Uh, a couple other occlusion of vessels. Uh, again, I think most of you uh, know what I'm talking about here. Uh, blood clots, embolisms that occur, clamping of vessels. When they clamp them off so they can do a surgical procedure, they leave that too long. Uh, it doesn't take long uh, in many cases for blood flow to decrease uh, and blood flow to lead to this. This is the one I think most everybody in here will see most often is the stressful exercise impact of just doing too much exercise. And the question is, what's too much? I get that question quite often, and that's a great question because there's no answer to that. There is no answer to what's too much. And I'm going to give you a little case study to show you where that, that comes into play here. Uh, electrical, uh, electrocution, think about muscle work based on electricity, hypothermia, heat stroke, all of these things can lead and have been documented to, to lead that. So these are the physical causes, but there's also non-physical that you have to watch for. And this is usually what's looked at first. If you get admitted to a hospital, what, is, what the doctors do first is they're, they're typically right away going to run uh, blood analysis on you to find out if you can do drugs. Uh, drugs can lead to this. And so um, when we see this, any kind of myopathy here, McArdle syndrome, anybody know what McArdle syndrome is? So McArdle syndrome, when we look at McArdle syndrome, it's the inability to actually break down glucose. It's a, it's a, a, a genetic default. You pick the wrong parents, <laughs> all right? And that's a big problem. And you pick both the wrong parents because it's an autosomal uh, disorder where a person can't break down uh, glycogen. So it's missing an enzyme for the glycogen process. And so that leads to it. Drugs, I wanted to pass out something to you because I got this question uh, actually after the Rocky Mountain from Mike uh, uh, years ago when we did the Rocky Mountain, you know, a table of drugs. So uh, I, I put together uh, a, a list of different uh, types of things. If, if we could pass those out, that'd be great. Listing all the uh, different types of drugs that can actually lead to this, this process. So if you do come across that, but there's many. Usually if somebody gets admitted, the first thing they start looking at is uh, heroin, cocaine, Cocaine in particular, you know, you've heard me talk about how it destroys the heart valves before if you've been in classes with me, but, but cocaine will also destroy muscle tissue. So it's one of the first things they look at. You know, have you been doing drugs? And where we see a lot of it, poor bliss. We see a lot of it as a military down there. Military again is where we see a lot of the rhabdo come out. The first thing they always test is what were you doing Friday night without drinking too much, dehydrating yourself, and in turn, were you also doing drugs? Saturday morning is when people wake up, you know, if, they're, if they have them out there at zero five in the morning or six, all of a sudden running in the heat, you know, early mornings in the summer, and then you compound that with what happened the night before. You kind of set up that perfect storm this way. And then, of course, in the desert, snake bites. Uh, snakes are out pretty heavy right now. If, you, if you've been out in the outer part of the desert, the, the diamondbacks are out there in, in great quantity. I think I've had about six. Now, uh, on my place. And so they're really coming out in force. So you have to watch that. Uh, infections and any other type of uh, abnormalities. Uh, there's some other things on the list that I didn't put up here that, that are really bizarre. Uh, there's been one documented case of somebody with uh, rhabdomyolysis from eating too much black licorice. So there's a chemical in black licorice. And I don't know how much this lady had to consume. <laughs> you know, she was eating gallons of it or what she was doing uh, or black licorice. It was an addiction. But there's a chemical in black licorice trigger it, just like the quail that can trigger it. So it's, you, you don't always know what's going to lead to this. That's, again, a kind of a bizarre situation. I want to take you through the disease aspect so everybody uh, gets kind of a, a review again on how this works. So let's think of it from some kind of an injury, over-exercise, -exer uh, stressful exercise situation. If you start with the extracellular fluid, remember everything outside the cell, we see it start to in initially start moving into the, the intercellular space, comes within the cell structure. So that's what we're seeing. Uh, physiologically uh, after an exertional amount of exercise, high amount of exertion. And then as that calcium builds up in the cell, we eventually start to get the cell to start to implode and everything starts leaking through the membrane. So after about 12 hours, the membrane starts breaking down. Now all of you, uh, if you've ever exercised before, you get sore. That's really the beginning of this. 
and it's the same process. So you have felt that soreness after a good exercise two days later, it's like, oh, God, my legs are killing me. I was doing squats, your chest is sore. That's the beginning of it. It's when you take it to the next level is where we really classify this as a, a rapid situation here. And so everything in the cell leaks out. These are the things that you guys have seen leaking out. Myoglobin, uh, again, if you, if you um, look at myoglobin, it's a protein structure that carries oxygen within the cell. Uh, quick, how do we know it's a, a protein, you guys? I and ending, right? So if I see an I and ending, I know that there's a it's a protein structure here. So myoglobin's carrying <laughs> oxygen within the muscle. Isn't that awesome? Yeah. So uh, creatine kinase, uh, creatine kinase enzyme for catabolizing ATP. Creatine kinase is looked at uh, very closely. If you are suspected of having a heart attack and it's within the last 24 hours, as soon as you get in the emergency room, they'll they'll run uh, when they start running blood tests, they look for for CK right away because when creatine kinase is elevated, you destroy the tissue. And so it's a good indicator. Now it's absorbed by the tissue in about 24, 48 hours. So it doesn't have a great indicator after a time uh, per se. But with skeletal muscle, I'll show you some data where it can stay a long time. This is the mass, the size of the body by comparison to the heart. Lactate dehydrogenase, again, an enzyme for breaking down uh, from pyruvate to lactic acid. Uh, uh, high, high cholesterol, or high uh, uh, potassium, I should say, lactic acid. All of these things that are in the cell, basically, are leaking out. We don't want them to leak out because our kidneys have to now filtrate that out. So think of uh, all these solid particles getting into the bloodstream and now the kidneys have to clean that out. So you don't have that free flowing blood, it dams it up. It really dams it up, which in turn then is gonna shut the kidneys down and that's what I'll show you here shortly. So we get necrosis of tissue. Uh, you know, when you exercise and you're sore, you kill tissue, you've, you've damaged tissue, we know that. And so uh, fluid accumulates, and in these, these extreme cases, that fluid will accumulate so much in the damaged cells, uh, cellular area. We see limbs can inflate by you know, 20 pounds of fluid retention in, in areas, and legs will just inflame. So uh, I'll, I'll come back to the very first picture we had up there. It gets so taut around the skin, it just gets shiny, extremely shiny around that area because there's so much fluid retention. So imagine throwing an extra couple gallons of water in, in each thigh. I mean, that's a lot of fluid retention that we have here. And then I think all of you heard, you study it, you know about compartmental syndrome as well. Uh, I think I tried to throw in another nasty picture of that here shortly for you so you can see compartmental syndrome up close a little bit more. And then we end up with what we call mild uh, uh, lobinuria, acute renal failure. So you got the myoglobin that's actually damming up the kidneys. And I'll show you that nephron here shortly, but it dams it up, stops blood flow, uh, uh, or stops urine uh, flow very well. And that's where we end up with, with uh, the damaged kidneys. So I don't know if you can see that closely or not. So here's uh, uh, one of my uh, students that, you know, it's great having that many students. You always have somebody gets injured somewhere uh, when you have this in an unfortunate state. But here's a, a kid that's riding dirt bikes and uh, went down and took out about everything in his lower extremity, as you can see with this. But a good example of compartmental syndrome that you see on the lower slide there, it's just like taking beef. You cut it open and just let it uh, stay open. Because if you keep that cellular tissue intact in the skin, it just inflates so much, pressure goes in and shuts down you know, blood flow as such. I don't know if I have the other one. There, there he is, and you can see what his calf looks like after that. Uh, so this, you know, rhabdo is a concern in this, but then of course the, the, the complete inflammation of the tissue. The back of the knee, you can see on the anterior side, you can see where the tibialis anterior over the, on the lateral side a little bit, it's just inflamed around the whole anterior side of the, of the leg itself uh, in that case. So here's just a good, uh, your basic classical anatomy book uh, picture of the nephron. The, the basic idea of this is as blood's flowing through, we have this whole structure which helps filtrate out the blood. And we have uh, you know, literally millions of these structures in every kidney. It just dams it up. And so when you start damming it up, some of the things that we're going to show you here is what, what we can see in the practical world of how we take care of this process. So I get this question of who's affected? I mean, who is this going to affect? Who isn't it going to affect? And the answer is any one of us can be affected by this. But we do see that under certain conditions, some are affected more so than others. Uh, and I don't care if you're well-trained or untrained. It matters not. All right. What we find with those that are really in great condition is that they're pushed even harder because they have that ability to push themselves even harder. We'll see that in that same condition group. So don't think it's just somebody who doesn't do anything. Uh, yeah, again, it can be anybody in that case. So condition, decondition, it matters not. Uh, trauma cases, of course, and then the outcome uh, is going to either be something from really mild, did we take care of it right away, or did we let it go? And if we let it go, that's usually where you run into the problem. So you're the first responders in this case. You know, as athletic trainers, you see this uh, usually first if 
the individuals will tell you what's going on with them, and that's one of the things that we see. It's it's a little bit problematic. If someone doesn't want to tell you, you know, they keep it a secret for a couple days, and that every every minute is working against you when when, you, when that happens. So uh, again, muscle pain to complete uh, renal failure, and the example I'm going to give you here shortly from the student. It almost killed him. So we almost had a catastrophe on the campus, and almost killed the athletic training student in this case. So the thing to look for again is muscle pain, uh, and, and again, 50% of the people that we see that they get this never complain. It's, it, you know, they're sore, but they never complain about anything as such. So that doesn't help you any if nobody's going to talk to you. If nobody's talking to you, it doesn't do you a lot of good. You know, if you look at these symptoms, weakness, swelling, I mean, it's not like it's rocket science here. You know, it happens under a lot of conditions. It doesn't have to be rhabdo in this case. Uh, the necrosis of the skin, if it's an extreme case, we start to get into a, you know decreased blood flow and so forth. We can lead to other things like fever. Then there's something going on. We can ask ourselves that. Uh, heart rate changes typically because of the blood volume and the and the viscosity, the thickness of the, uh, the blood changes a lot. Uh, vomiting. But the thing I think everybody here knows is the discoloration of urine. That's the best case to look at. Is most of us know we should be urinating yellow or clearish color. Uh, and I'll show you the different colors and what to look for in the stages with that. If you're ever urinating something that's other than clear or yellow, right, something's wrong, all right? And you would just think of it that way. We shouldn't be urinating red or black or coffee grounds, uh, which, which is a distinct possibility here. So the thing that I, I recommend to everybody in this case is it's, it is difficult to detect within a good first 12 to 24 hours at times. We won't see any kind of results other than, wow, I'm sore from a workout. Okay, we don't always know it. You're walking around, everything's just fine, and we don't see that. Uh, usually after that 20, 12, 24 hour period, now we start to see urine colors change a little bit. And it's really slow. And so it's going from a yellowish color to kind of a tea, you know, a, a light tint or a teaish color in this case. And what that is, it's accumulation of mild blood, it's blood. You know, we're starting to get bloody urine is what we're getting in this case. And that's the first sign. If you can get to the emergency room at that point and, and you see that, which is what they need to do right away uh, to, get, to get in with IVs and start diluting the bloodstream a lot more, that will then usually stop the process or slow it down dramatically. But it's when people wait if we run into those problems. So a slight tint, it will progress and get darker as more and more blood accumulates and the kidneys get so dammed up. It's almost like putting, it's like tar. Literally, if you look at tar on the road, if they tar roads that really, really thick, you ever get that on your car and try and clean it off, it's extremely tough to get off, off, uh, off the vehicle, and that's what your kidneys do. Once they completely dam up, they're pretty much done. And even dialysis doesn't necessarily work. You can't clean out the kidneys with this one. So, so you know, find, find right away, if someone does tell you, you know, something, if they do confide in you, and this is the problem, again, a lot of people don't want to say, you know, hey, by the way, I'm urinating coffee grounds. Uh, who wants to talk like that? So they'll just kind of keep that a secret and, and hope if I drink enough Gatorade, as I was talking to some people, it'll fix everything and everything will go away. And, and Gatorade, believe it or not, doesn't fix everything uh, in this case. So this is the recommendation across the board. If you look at any medical personnel, MDs out there, I'll tell you right away, you got to get in and, and get this taken care of. So the guidelines, there are several guidelines that are out there as far as, all right, once, if we can make it through the rhabdo scenario, and if it isn't too bad, or if you did have to go through a longer period, what is the risk of this happening again? Can a person come back to activity? How long is it going to take to come back to activity? So the, the risk here is, is, is definitely based upon the individual and the situation and how bad it got. You know, delayed recoveries that we have up here. Um, uh, if we start looking at the creatine kinase, kinase levels, if you can get medical records and see how far did it elevate with this particular individual. Again, I'll give you some data. When you start to look at 100,000 uh, 100, international units per liter, that's huge when we should be down somewhere around 5 to, to 10. So it, it's massive, which again means that the kidneys are, are in overdrive. If there's a family history, we also see sometimes a person's more susceptible. Think of genetics again. You know, pick the right parents so you don't have to deal with it, but it's all too late. Sorry, guys. Uh, nothing you can do with that one. Uh, heat illness will definitely go back. The low risk individuals are the one that had uh, 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 less or smaller or shorter amounts of time again with this, the, 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 the lesser of the effects. So that's always a positive in this case. Uh, if you have no history, if you've managed to get to the emergency room that same day, many times they can get it stopped very, very quickly through the decrease in the, the viscosity of the blood and so forth. So, um, but there are other things that are in there too, and, and, and like I said, the first thing they're usually going to ask is, and they usually ask you privately, 
uh, you know, any drugs? Is there something you need to tell us? You know, we're, we're going to find out with blood testing uh, eventually, but if, but if you uh, can let us know ahead of time, it helps us kind of go through that process. So let me give you a, a quick case study of what actually happened to me here with uh, two students that we had here on campus. One was an athletic training student in the program. Uh, apparently, I didn't know this, but he attended school here for two years. Uh, and then left for 10 years. I knew he was gone for a while, went back to, um, to a job, became a respiratory therapist, and then came back to school on athletic training after that. Uh, he was 36 years of age, so he's an older individual when he came back. Some of you know uh, Brian. Uh, I know he's working as an athletic trainer, to my understanding, still in El Paso or somewhere. Is he gone now? <laughs> Did he move to Houston? Is that where he's gone now? Okay, because I haven't heard from him in a while, but extremely active in cycling, loved to race cycling. Uh, and he was, he was a scrawny kid, really, really thin. I call him a kid, but, but um, really a thin guy as, as such. And so, uh, what, what we, i just give you an overall demographics of, of Brian uh, as such. Uh, and we're, we're in the process of writing all this up. We're going to be sending it to a research journal, so i got to find Brian wherever he is. If you guys know where he is, let me know. I can't, can't find him. So, Houston's hard to kind of narrow down. There's a few people there, so I'll need some help with that one. But, um, yeah, and I don't do the Facebook and Tweety. Is that what you guys do, Tweety? Twitter, whatever it is. All right, so, um, so with that, if you, if you look at this, again, he was 36 years, uh, years of age at this point. He wasn't a very big, big individual, 155 pounds, you know, a fairly thin, thin guy, which is, again, you find that runners and, and cycling, you know, it's, it's more conducive to the, the activity and the sport this way. And he did, he was, he was competing, he was racing all the time, so he was very, very active in this, in this respect. And so to give you an overview of what happened, we brought him down Friday to the gym with another student. There was a, a female who did some recreational cycling. She didn't do much, you know, at, at this point. And uh, they both came down to my lab and we were doing some uh, exercise and, and some experimentation. They wanted to go through some, some uh, light workouts and so forth. So we brought him down at 5.30. Uh, that we were in a temperature controlled building. Everything was, you know, it was all, there was no heat. Uh, issues with direct sunlight, there was no fluid issues, we had endless water and, and so forth. Two participants, again the, uh, the female there, and the, the goal of this was not to induce rhabdo, but it ended up that way. That's, that's kind of the way things worked out. You know, it's like, hey, we're going to bring you in, see if we can put you in intensive care for 15 days. That wasn't the plan, but it turned out that way is what, what happened with this one. And so let me look, take you through, you know, we had everybody go through a really nice warm up, real gentle on a stationary bike, about 15, 20 minutes, a lot of stretching, walking around before we started this. Again, that's, you know, a very easy going, gentle warm up. They were, they were, in, they were just fine with this process. Um, a lot of static stretching that we did and we got in there. So at about six o'clock we started off, we just did 40 minutes of exercise. So it wasn't exactly a very long period of time for somebody. But uh, in this case, we, we had light pressing squats, and we had them going back and forth between the two exercises uh, through this. And there, there was hardly any weight. And, we had, and both of them were doing the exact same. All right, so everything was, it's kind of convenient for a research study. It wasn't a study, but it's turned out convenient for us. Uh, unfortunately, but it, but it did, I guess, in a fortunate way. So um, when you look at this, they're very light. I mean, you look at 95 pounds in, in the world of lift, that's not very much weight. I mean, you got a bar and a couple quarters put on each side and you're set there. The leg press was about the same. Uh, we had two or three people down there, you know, that were helping out with the process. And again, these two came to me and asked to do it, which was kind of an interesting process that we went through, but we did. And uh, we just kept our reps about eight to 10. Their final uh, reps at the very end of this was the 15 pound bar and aluminum bar. It's a, it's a lightweight aluminum bar usually used uh, for individuals of a lesser strength. And so 15 pounds is really nothing. All right, very much, uh, very, very little in weight. So, so uh, we had the light press, um, and there's Brian there. You can see with the squats again. I mean, he's a, he's about as big as that bar when you look at it. He's a, he's he's thin, thin thin guy this way, and and um, so. Uh, again, what we did is after the exercise, about seven o'clock, we we went through a long kind of cool down. They walked around. Everybody's fine. You know, there was nothing going on. It was just you and I having a conversation. We're finished this way. At 8 o'clock, we finally got done. We went outside, we were talking for a little bit. The temperature was fairly, uh, you know, climate controlled uh, this time of the year outside. It wasn't extreme heat or anything else. There was nothing, there was nothing extreme. There was no signs that anything was going to happen whatsoever in this situation. So 75 degrees outside, uh, but he lived in El Paso. So when he got into the car afterwards, he sat in a stationary position. We started looking back at all the events that really led to this. Sat in a stationary position for a good hour drive home at this point. 
Now, cycling and, and lifting are completely two different entities when it comes to workouts. And we see most of the rhabdo cases out there under some kind of exertional strength training uh, or at least body weight in, a, in an anaerobic process, not an aerobic process. We, don't, we very rarely ever see it in an aerobic type of activity or sport. And so with this, uh, he definitely was not accustomed. He may have trained a lot, but, but uh, he realized just how out of shape he really was when we put him in the weight room. It was a whole different animal for him to, to go through like this. So about 10 o'clock, uh, he got home, it was late, he was hungry, he was extremely fatigued at this point, and so um, he didn't eat much that night, he told us, and he just basically went straight home, went to bed, didn't drink any fluids at all afterwards. So again, we started putting all this together. Uh, the, the second day on Saturday, like all good athletic training students do, right? You got to be back here at four o'clock so you can be on the football field, you know, out there by six and seven a.m. So he took an hour drive back. He came back. He worked on the athletic field for about six hours that day, running around. And about four o'clock is when he started noticing urine color changes, but he didn't tell anybody. He said Gatorade will fix it. <laughs> it didn't. And it continued to get worse. And he did, he refused to tell anybody. And he admits it. I mean, that's how we know. He's like, I wasn't going to tell anybody. I was embarrassed. You know, I'm an athletic trainer. I'm a respiratory therapist, you know. I'm not going to tell anybody I'm urinating something other than I'm, what do you do? Walk up to the high. What color is your urine? You know, it's not a conversation you have with people. Now he did call the other the other student that did this and said, I'm just check, what color is your urine? He's like, huh? You know, what kind of phone call is a prank call? What's going on? It's a little strange to be talking about your urine uh, at this point. So about 22 hours, which again falls into that category where we see that really starting to change color. So he just drank fluids and continued to ignore it because it was going to fix itself and go away. And so at this point too, then we saw as he continued to go forward, he started doing things that all of us are trained to do. And I'm going to tell you, it's time to stop doing that in this particular situation. You know, you're trained under rice. You know, we talk about massage therapy, we talk about the hot and cold therapies and so forth, we talk about the elevation. Here's where it goes wrong. When you have uh, da damaged muscle tissue like this, and as it gets worse and worse, and you start massaging that, what you do, it's like, it'd be like taking a, a, a bulldozer to this building, you're massaging the, the, the cellular structure, you just keep breaking it down and everything starts to escape. You start to look at hot and cold therapy, you, by changing the temperature, again, you get the expansion and contraction of cells, and so they're already breaking down, so when you, when you treat it that way, it breaks them down even faster. So everything that, that he was taught to do in a standard procedure is completely wrong in this case. All right, so you do have to watch that. The things that we learn don't necessarily work this way. So when I went down, I talked to, when we finally got to the hospital, I'll tell you that in a few minutes, show you when we ended up at the, the hospital, the nephrologist, went through the whole list with me and he says, everything that you learn there is wrong. He says, you can't do that. We want zero movement because if we start massaging and, and moving, we just continue to rupture more of these cells and he goes, and it causes the kidneys to dam up even faster. So we have to try and isolate your movements under these kind of conditions. I asked him how prevalent it was and he says, I see it out of four bliss continuously. We see it come through all the time. We've got to stop the people from moving for a while because if they move, it just escalates their, their, their levels of myoglobin and create kinase. So it's, it's something that, you know, it's kind of backwards from what most of us learn in the world of, of, of rehabilitation and treatments. On the third day, Sunday came through. So we see about 36 hours post when he woke up, it was starting to turn into a much darker color at this point. Still walking around in extreme pain at this point. And it continued. Uh, doing everything you know he thought was right at this point. All right, he just kept doing what what he thought was right, and and again then he started getting even more and more massage, which they found even accelerated it even faster. You know, thinking that was going to let the pain go away, and it and it didn't work for him this way. So Monday came and he actually had a test um, uh, in one of my classes, and so he calls and says it was early in the morning. He said I'm not going to be able to make it. He had a stick stick shift. So then he couldn't push on the clutch, he couldn't move, he kind of got himself into the car uh, in, in bad shape. But when he woke up, uh, if you look at coffee, a dark brown coffee, he was urinating a dark brown, almost black color at this point. So at some point you'd think the light bulb would go mm -hmm. on and say, something's wrong, all right, something's wrong. But he, he kind of refused. He's like, ah, I'm going to keep fighting it because I think, you know, if I, maybe if I drink a different color Gatorade, it'll fix it. But, but, it, but it wasn't working for him here. So, what he did is he, he went through and, and uh, his wife's brother was a medical doctor practicing in Texas, so he called him. 
and says, you know, I don't know if something's right or wrong, but you know, I worked out the other day to do this, and I'm, and I'm urinating almost like coffee grounds at this point. So it was turning into chunky coffee grounds, he said, as he was urinating. So just try and picture that as you, as you hear that in the toilet bowl coming out. You know, kind of a sad sound, and, and he's like, what are you doing? You need to be in ER, and you need to be there. He, it, it, uh, it was pretty cool, because the guy said, either you get to ER now, or you're going to be dead soon. And that's what he told him straight up. You will not want to do this. Well, that then put the fear of God into him. So his, his wife drove him over to the hospital. As soon as they went in, they asked for a urine sample. When they saw it, they said they grabbed him and rushed him into the ER as fast as they could because they saw when it was black when it came out in the cup. They knew we could be at the end of this process. So, so it, was, it was at that point. And the female participant, not a single thing. All right, nothing. She was sore. She reported for about 11 days she was sore after this. But, but she, nothing, nothing ever came out of it at, at all. So you brought in the year analysis cups for us, did you? <laughs> cool. Yeah, there we go. So now we have the tea color. <laughs> Hopefully it doesn't taste the same though, right? <laughs> oh, God, Bernie, that's gross. <laughs> okay, so, so if you look at his legs up here, uh, we took the pre-picture post, if you want to think of it that way, because we, uh, after he, he went through a full recovery. So the one on the left is what the normal picture, you can see how, you can see the patella, everything else stands out pretty clear with his legs. And look at the inflammation that we see now in the legs that are occurring. They put him on so many IVs that he, he weighed 155 pounds. Once they got him on the IV treatment on that Monday, they were just simply trying to get as much fluid into him as possible to try and help the kidneys. Uh, decrease the viscosity of the blood, and so at this point they uh, he weighed 205 pounds. That's how much fluid they put on him in 24 hours. You couldn't even see his face. His face just was huge. And what was really interesting is, is uh, one of the doctors that he worked with as a respiratory therapist walked into the room, didn't look at his chart, but looked at him. Didn't know who he was because he was so bloated from the IVs uh, that they put into him. There were so many that went into him in this case. He walked in and said, I think we're going to end up amputating your legs, but we'll see. And turned around and walked out. Didn't even know it was Brian. You know, until he saw his charts later and came back and said, oh, God, man, I'm sorry. I didn't mean to say that to you. It's like, you say that to all your patients? You know? <laughs> so, because he's still conscious. It's not like he's unconscious. You're sitting there talking to a person, you know. I mean, he walked in under his own, under his own ability. But when he heard that, I mean, and, and they were saying, you know, if, if we can't get this to control, we're going to have to amputate both legs. There's nothing else we can do at this point. So it was getting very, very serious. Uh, in this situation. And so you can see five days post on that. What I couldn't get when I took the pictures on the right is we couldn't get the picture of the, the dark urine coming through uh, the calf here. So there's the urine that, that he was urinating, took a quick sample and a picture of that. Uh, again, you know something's wrong. Stop and, and realize something is wrong with this, this process here. Oops. So, so that's, that's a, a, a big key to, to look at here. I don't know why we have a blank slide. So if we look at this one here, here are some of his blood tests that he actually had. The ones I want you guys to, to, to look at mostly here, I pulled out some of the key ones, but what I wanted you to see here is the international units per liter, what we should be at on a typical basis. This will rise if you hurt yourself just lifting, where you get sore, you're sore a couple days later, it's gonna go up, but the kidneys are easily capable of taking care of it. This is day four, and the laboratory uh, testing, the doctor finally had to tell him, you got to use a special test because once you get to a certain level, the labs will only go so high. But they estimate it was a little over 200,000 international units inside him at this point for, for every liter of blood. And so what you're looking at is when he was in ICU. So he was in ICU at day seven, you can still see he was still at 81,000 at this point. So it's a very, very slow, slow decline. Uh, they, were, they were contemplating kidney dialysis. Uh, they weren't sure if they are going to have to or not. It was pretty messed up because his wife's a nurse, and she came in to, to visit him and in ICU. They had the dialysis machine sitting right outside the door because they just performed dialysis on the neighboring uh, room. You know? And so they just rolled it out and it was sitting there. And so when she walked in, she's like, oh my god, dialysis, here we are. And it, and it wasn't. It, was, you know, it, it really kind of flipped her out at that point. But here, if you look at intensive care, we keep going. So we start to look at day eight, day nine. So he was still in there. So obviously school was over for him that semester uh, at that point. When I met the doctor, the doctor said, squats? I said, yes. He goes, no more squats. He was from India. He said, no more squats. He goes, you're the professor who does squats. No more squats. Uh, but he was a great doctor. He really was a good teaching doctor at this point, too. So um, after 
14 days in the hospital. They finally got it down to about 5,000 uh, international units. And so then they let him go home. He was in a wheelchair and, and a walker for several months uh, before he'd get full control back because of the damage that occurred to the, to the legs at this point. So it was long. It was a long, drawn-out process. Uh, they wouldn't let him do anything he wanted to do, like get back on a bike or anything else. So he paid this price for, for a good six months after this. And then it was very slow in coming back. Now, um, again, if we see this, you can see that the, the uh, creatine, creatine kinase levels, uh, again, continued down. I guess we're a little bit around 800. I, I was thinking we're closer to 5,000. I guess that was 12 days. Because in 12 days, um, they let him out of the hospital. And if they, if back, they had him keep coming back in to continue to run the test to make sure that it was still going down. They didn't want to have any kind of relapse. And they were a little, they were a little fearful of that at that point. So uh, the kinds of things that he went through in this case, uh, they were loading them up with everything uh, and painkillers like crazy. You know, they were just loading them up with painkillers. He said, I felt so good that week, I didn't feel a thing, you know. Uh, but but uh, uh, they really filled him up with about everything they could to try and get him through this process. So the outcome, like I said, it was a, over a 50 pound gain in, in less than 24 hours when they loaded him up with the IVs and, and he did, it looked like a, a water balloon, but it was, it was pretty impressive to see how the body could absorb all that. It's the 12 days I was telling you about here, six days in the general med ward, uh, just to continue to follow. The kidneys took quite a while, so there was kidney damage, uh, and it took a while before the kidneys would actually recover in this case. Uh, the walker and the cane was a long process for him and, and he wasn't happy about that one. Uh, except he did take this back to all his, his clients and then when he was working in the schools and so forth as an athletic trainer after he came back and graduated, he did make sure that he passed this on to as many people as he could so, they, so, so students would be aware of that kind of thing. And so it was about six months before he was back up in full action. So think about you knocking out six months of your life for a 40 minute workout. Now there was things on there um, that, that really brought us in. Things that he didn't bother to tell us about before it all happened. So the day before, he was still training for another race. He went out, did a 40-mile ride, uh, was very dehydrated, but didn't bother to tell anybody that he wasn't. He got back late. He had to get to the athletic training room. You know, this, all these types of things went on. He was extremely dehydrated before he started this. Uh, we found out also that he had a thyroid condition, and his medication was completely uh, out of balance. Uh, the doctors couldn't get it in balance, and he hadn't gone back in to check on it in several weeks, and they knew it was out. So then that also contributed greatly to this process. Again, there's always a history. When you go back, you know something led to this process. Uh, the, 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 the day before, he was pre-fatigued. The exercises that you do in strength and conditioning, eccentric, if you'll recall, is really what causes damage to muscles. The, it's the length in the muscle. That's where we see the, the damage coming from. So he didn't experience that as much on a bike as you would in the, in the resistance exercise here. And then afterwards, he just didn't do anything. He went home and went to sleep. You know? So again, he contributed, unfortunately, a lot to this when we look back at it, at it in hindsight. Especially number two up there, the thyroid. Uh, he didn't disclose any of that to us. So when we, we do kind of a pre-assessment uh, ahead of time, you know, uh, and, and kind of a health screening and so forth, he just didn't bother to tell anybody. He's like, oh, I didn't think it really mattered. It, it matters. All right, it matters. And so uh, after this, standing around, we found in that temperature, even though you know the body temperature thing is really hot after exercise, now we have a rapid cooling. You know, 75 degrees outside, your core is probably sitting, especially in the muscle, probably closer to 106, 107 degrees Fahrenheit uh, in working muscle. We know it'll elevate to that temperature during hard workouts. As long as you're sweating and cooling, it's really not a big deal it's, uh, as such. But then you stand outside at 75, all of a sudden you're dealing with a 30, 40 degree temperature grade. You cool very rapidly, and so we do see the constriction of muscle uh, at that point. Uh, and he was, he started showing some shivering aspects in the 75 degrees, and that's when we said, we gotta get sweats on and get you going and so forth here. Didn't eat, didn't drink. Uh, the next day, he didn't drink till he came out actually onto the athletic field. You know, he didn't do anything. He skipped breakfast, he hadn't eaten in 24 hours. You know, he just, he just, he said, I'm tired. I'm like, yeah, but, you know, you still need the fluids here. Uh, when he noticed that the urine was changing, he didn't tell a soul. So nobody knew whatsoever because he thought it would fix itself this way. And he went through and did what you expect everybody to do. As we said, urine continued to get darker on day three. Still refused to accept any medical advice. Uh, dark brown, called the relative, the medical doctor, uh, told him to get to the ER. And that's, that's uh, basically what took him into the, the next uh, 12 days in the hospital. 
So what I would hope that you guys could take away from this, signs, symptoms, the history of the whole aspect, uh, you know, ask about other conditions. If you do run across it, is there something else about the individual that you don't know about? Let's see if you can get some background information because it does help the medical pers personnel figure out a way to help treat the process a little bit quicker. Uh, hydration, hydration, I mean, that's not something any of us don't know about, but we definitely skip it at times. Uh, be careful about what we learn because some of the common sense stuff that we learn doesn't necessarily apply in this case. Uh, anytime we're in that urine discoloration, we definitely want to get to the emergency room. It's just, it's nothing to mess around with with the kidneys like that. Any questions anybody has? I flew through it, so yes, ma'am. Uh, one question, just looking through this, I didn't see anything on it. Um, individuals with sickle cell, does that have a big impact on their susceptibility to getting this? Absolutely, yeah, sickle cell, sickle cell uh, trait is something actually in, uh, that's, that's listed for the NCAA. If you look in, in, in the NCAA uh, manual, which is what, three, four hundred pages, I've read through parts of that before, and they actually have full sections in there on sickle cell trait and how it has a direct impact on rhabdomyolysis. You're much more susceptible with that. And we see it in African American most, most likely. That's the most common area that we see that. So yes, and there's a lot of data that supports that, and that's one of the reasons with sickle cell that this also can compound the problem with, with African Americans. We see a greater propensity in that, in that region. So yes, you bet, good question. Any other questions? What about your sign? Are you just looking for that fluid retention, or if they're not gonna tell you specifically that their urine's changing, or they have more sort of tasks at the time? <coughs> Do you look for anything else besides what you're So her question is, is there any other signs or that you can look for if the person doesn't disclose the urine color and so forth? And unfortunately, generally, no. You can't see it just by looking at someone. So even, even when Brian's out on the field that whole next day working as a student athletic trainer on the football field, not a single thing uh, popped up that we could see. Even day three, nothing. Even day four, when he, he walked his way into the emergency room with his wife, as far as appearance goes, unless he disclosed the fact that he was in extreme pain, and even, even the emergency room at first, you know, they're like, okay, you're sore, what's going on, until they saw the urine. Then they knew right away that it was above and beyond what would be a normal, a normal soreness or, or complaint at this point. But there was nothing that just stood out. We didn't see anything. You can't see that typically in individuals. And if they don't tell you, uh, that's, that's where we run into these issues. Uh, a, a big example, this was just a couple of years, where this really hit the press and media again, was out of Iowa, when a strength coach took 13 football, well, took a whole, a whole team or group, and then implemented a, a really high intensity strength training program with them. And there was a long period where they hadn't been doing much, but pushed them over the edge in this case. So what's that? I think it was their first day back. It was, yes sir. And so 13 players were admitted to, to uh, the emergency room for Rapto that same, that next day uh, with urine. And several of them had urine discoloration they found out later that didn't bother to tell anybody when their buddies were going in. So this really said, when, when things like this happen at a university, the, the thing the university is first looking at is major lawsuit. What's going to happen with this process? Where are we at? So they, they put a task force together, and it's online. You can find it. It's a really thick uh, overview of what occurred from this. And so they, they, were, they were consulting agencies like the American College of Sports Medicine, NATA, the National Strength Conditioning Association, trying to get all this information and data about it. What can we do to try and prevent this? How do we convince the parents, et cetera, et cetera. And if you look at a lot of your textbooks as you, as you go through, you may find a paragraph or less on these topics. There's very little to nothing. None of the ex-biz books that are out there ever have this kind of thing. You know, we went through and started looking at it, and uh, there, was, there was actually an individual, she's now passed on, who's big in the field of studying Rabdo. She went through and tried to find every sports medicine book that she could find, and they found, out of nine textbooks, they found one paragraph that, that discussed it. And so that was something that she was trying to push to at least get more information out there for people. So if they run into something like this, you, you have an idea, you know, what's going on, and, and let's at least see the treatment. Uh, from this case. So that, that exploded at, at Iowa. But if you start digging into some of the research and the, and the, uh, the case studies that are out there, you go on and on. There's several, it, there's a long list of Division I schools that have, that have created this. And I don't want you to think you have to do a lot. So I'll give you an example. There were seven swimmers at a Division I institution that went out and did 10 minutes of push-ups and body squats. And all of them were admitted with, with uh, rhabdomyolysis. You know, it's pretty bizarre. You're thinking 10 minutes, not a big deal. Uh, a case that I was talking about with some people for this in, in Japan, where they take 
uh, you know, they're a lot more regimented in a lot of their activities. So they have 120 kids, kids, young kids, admitted to uh, their emergency room for, for Ravville uh, because they had them all in a giant formation, like a military formation of 120 young kids doing push-ups and body squats again. And, and hearing powers just exploded with all these kids. So it's, again, pretty bizarre. You, you really have to look to see what's going to happen with that, what's the atmospheric conditions, what's the, hydro, uh, the hydration conditions. And then a lot of people, like you look at this other uh, individual, nothing, nothing ever comes from that. So there, there's a little bit of propensity from an, uh, from an individual basis, too, because most people, you could take and abuse them quite greatly in a weight room, and they get sore you know, and a little damage. I mean, you can really abuse people and, and they never see it. Because this stuff isn't running rampant. It's when you have the one or two kids or the one person you run across that it could kill them. That's a serious situation that you really have to watch for. So you typically don't see like 13 football players going down at once. It's usually, you know, one a year or yeah. something like that. I'm sure you've seen it in, in the field once a year, you know, things like that. And again, you just don't always know what's happening with that. So any other questions? Yes, sir. It'd probably be more of a clarification, but I mean, I mean the, the lack of mobilization or immobilization can be a cause. But at that point, right, he's already got it. It's pretty severe. They're put him in a wheelchair. He's not allowed to move. Right. Is it to the point of immobilization? Like, you don't move at all, or is it just kind of a new limit? So, 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 so in this case, <laughs> I'm going to answer that in two different ways. When we see a lot of immobilization issues, uh, is when you're sitting on a real hard surface. So, not a mobilization like you might think of as in. Or maybe a, a total of knee so bad that I'm not just looking at an ACL, but they, they immobilize the whole area maybe, or maybe the knee was infracted and so forth. But they're still oftentimes, at least in a wheelchair, maybe there's some flexor motion, you get some kind of activity that's going on, minimal, but there's still blood flow. It's when you immobilize, and say somebody's drunk, for example, or on a surgical table and they're on something about a hard surface, and there's no movement whatsoever. Uh, and, and again, we, we, we see that even uh, if you look at somebody that's in, in bed rest or somebody that's in a comatose state, you know, nurses will be moving people back and forth to try and get the pressure off because of bed sores and, and these types of things. Well, the same thing can lead to with the round toes. So when I talk about the immobilization, much of that's because you're on a really hard surface and there's no, no movement whatsoever for longer periods of time. Okay. Uh, different from what we might think of just going you know, to mobilize the knee or the position of surgeons have to do that, but still the rest of the body is still moving. Now in his case, they had him sitting in that chair, we saw the pictures, and they wouldn't let him get up. They allowed him to sit up in the chair, but they wouldn't let him move for a few days because even when he was just uh, flexing or extending there uh, with, with, with the knees at this point, and, and, and the quads and hamstrings were so, so sore and the inflammation was so bad, uh, he would, when he did, and they were doing the blood test on him three times a day to watch this. And so when he did, it spiked. I mean, it went up so rapidly, and that's when the, that's when the uh, physician says, stop, you can't move, because it, you spike it so quick, within about two hours, it's spiking it that, that drastically. So that's when they had him. They said, you sit, and you're not moving, because when you do that, we can't keep up with it, with the kidneys. It's, it's exploding the tissue too quickly. You know, the cellular membranes are just are, are, are rupturing too quickly. Does that answer your? Yeah, I mean, I, okay. that's kind of what I figured. It's like the lesser two needles at that point. But, you bet. Yeah. You bet. Other questions? Yes, sir. Kind of a stupid question, but it doesn't necessarily have to be bilateral. No. I mean, it can Absolutely be not. You can isolate it to a bicep. So where we see some cases which are bizarre is somebody's doing calf raises. See the calf raises and both calves go into this you know, by chance, or maybe just one or the other, but the rest of the, the body's not affected by it. So, so it, it doesn't have to be a whole, whole body. Where you see most of it, uh, you can almost nail it down to lower extremities. That's where we see it most often, but again, there are examples of upper extremities doing this, but you could have just your right, you know, the right, right calf structure, you know, soleus and gastroc together, and, and suddenly we've had that effect. So it doesn't have to be bilateral. Is that in the beginning, or is it the what do you mean? Can it go from just one gas trap to another gas trap that has So it's the muscle that's it's been the muscle that's been exercised in that muscle for whatever's going on in the cellular area, you know, why it triggers it in that particular area causes the rupturing of, of, of that cellular tissue. So it doesn't just run over and grab the other one, the other one's gonna do it, it's gonna do it as well if it, if it's a bilateral process. Most of them are bilateral. We don't see unilateral that much. Most is bilateral. And again, most are lower extremity because you have you know fifty percent of your body doing large muscle mass activity and that's where we see it triggered most often. 
Does that make sense? Well, I get more questions tonight than I get for like a whole semester. This is awesome. This is awesome. It's a sharp lunch. What's that? It's a sharp lunch. Yeah, yeah, maybe I should serve beer in my classes. <laughs> <laughs> Everybody sign up. <laughs> Somebody ties one on the week before they go and they haven't done anything and then the drill sergeant has absolutely no mercy and you're going to carry that pack or you're going to do three million setups before. And that's, and that's, and that's what the nephrologist says that he runs across most often in El Paso. Yeah. Is, is just exactly what you said. So Friday night, everyone's out drinking. <laughs> you know, uh, and alcohol is, of course, dehydrating a person dramatically. And then at 5 a.m., Everybody's out, and you know here in the desert, uh, they'll have everybody running out there, even though you know it's 90 degrees already at, at 6 a.m. type of thing, and just run them and run them or run them or put them on forced marches and so forth, 15, 20 miles in the desert. You know you're already starting at a deficit, and that's where they see the people you know dropping out. So they put themselves in that situation before they even had a chance. They were already there, and so lower extremities where he says he runs into that quite often. So when it happened, you know he wasn't surprised at all. Uh, he just simply said um, they don't usually see the numbers get that high typically. You know they see it in the forty or fifty thousand range. That Saturday was spring, spring ball, and he leaned against the, the wall in the stadium because his legs were that sore. He just yeah, hi, legs are warm. Mm -hmm. And he was just surprised, but the difference between riding a bike and doing squats. Big time. He's not trained to do squats. Absolutely. He's a little and competitive. Right. Wasn't going to not have good numbers. And he was competing against yeah. a female. And, so and, you put and, testosterone in the room, yeah. we, we always run into problems. <laughs> we really it, was do. it was a perfect storm. It really was for him that way. So no, you're absolutely correct in that case. And, I, and that's something if you've never really done the difference in a serious way between uh, strength training and uh, aerobic exercise, you never fully understand it. Completely, completely two different activities. And it doesn't take much. Uh, I, I tell anybody, if you give me 10 minutes uh, with squats, I can, I can finish you in a hurry. It doesn't take a lot to, to, to put somebody down. down. I think there's, well, though I know there was another case where some team ran hills. Yes. And that that's not their, their physical drills at all. Here's And it's it's you know when we talk about running, if we talk about running, it's down the hill because it's the eccentric, it's the slowing action that a lot of people don't think about that causes the the damage that way. It's the eccentric activity. Any other questions? Yes, sir. Is there any correlation between someone that cramps and I haven't seen anything in that area. I haven't seen anything related to cramping uh, or hand wrap I haven't seen that relationship anywhere. It doesn't mean it doesn't exist, but I haven't seen anything in, in any kind of research or documented literature. I have not read anything about cramping per se. Because again, you know, you run into people that can, no matter what, cramp all the time. Or they never cramp in practice, but when there's a crowd, you know, in the stadium when they cramp, you've seen that, you know, you need 4,000 bananas to talk about fixing that. <laughs> So, so yeah, we haven't seen a correlation in that in that respect. Again, it doesn't mean it doesn't exist, but I have not, I have personally not seen that anywhere in the written literature anywhere. Yes, ma'am. Um, I heard, I haven't really researched yet or read a lot of articles, but the correlation between like CrossFit and Rapto and I don't know if you want to get me started on so, so let me let me just take CrossFit and break it. Since they break people down, let me just let me give you the premise of, of, of CrossFit. You have to ask why the, the creator of CrossFit doesn't practice his own sport. But but um, but when you look at it, all CrossFit is, if you study anything about CrossFit, how much can I possibly do? And it's and it's self-created. Today I'm gonna uh, do deadlifts 400 pounds and run 400 meter sprints and come back and do some other crazy thing as much as I can possibly do. If you look at their website, it's based on volume high volume, and volume in turn is what typically leads to this kind of a, an outcome. And so we do see a high propensity. They've actually, CrossFit's lost a couple million dollar suits, lawsuits already because of Rapto cases. Uh, and, and they make so much money on the outside, what's a million or two dollars? It doesn't really bother them in that case because they keep that kind of <coughs> But it's the high, high volumes that really get people in trouble, you know, as far as the physical aspects go. So that's, that's what leads to it, you know.
know, from, from that process. But yeah, no, absolutely. I just want to make sure my thoughts are right. No, you're, you're right on track. Because there's been, there's been a, a ton of damage out there across the nation because of that. And, and people just don't understand. They never hear, heard of Rapco. Yeah. You, it never really come across it. You don't see that kind of thing. And then all of a sudden, they're put into a position where they see it's really cool. ESPN games are doing it. I'm going to go out and try that tomorrow and see what happens type mentality. No, but you're right. You're absolutely right. Any other questions? Another one. Dang. Well, you had mentioned like the correlation between Rapco and the required carbon. Is there anything in reverse, like having the carbon here? See, there's the concern. They can work both ways. Okay. So when you look at that, say, a crushing injury or like a motorcycle accident they had this way, if you don't relieve that pressure and as that muscle's inflaming and being damaged, then of course the, the poison in the blood is what we can look at it. So it can go either way. Absolutely. And the crushing is what really leads to those kinds of things. You crush it, the muscle inflames. You, if they don't cut that open to relieve that pressure, we still also have the internal mechanisms of the bloodstream, which then relates back to the kidneys and the filtration. So they're watching all of that. You bet. You bet. And, and we know compartmental syndrome, of course, is a nasty process. I mean, it's, there's nothing good about it, but those will definitely be things on the radar, you know, for any, any good physician that sees that. They definitely know. You bet. Other questions? Oh, I got to ask you guys simple questions. You know, it's you know, so we'll we'll see if we can put that through for you. So <laughs> you didn't think I was going to get out of out of one of my classes without a test, did you? Sorry, Dr. Gear. Welcome class. aboard. <laughs> <laughs> Everything's a class. It's all about learning. It's for your better. So Dr. Gear said he'd answer the first one for us. False. False. What do you guys think? the question. <laughs> you got a 50-50 chance. False. <laughs> What's the question? It's right there. You were right. Good guess. Thank you. Everybody good on that? Yes. All right. So let's make it longer. Let's let's add a few more words to the to the to the question here. Am I good on that? One in doubt, choose them all, right? All right, so let's make it even smaller with more words, you know? So the elderly can squint. <laughs> Not to pick on your mic or anything. That's why you moved to the front row. <laughs> Definitely want Gatorade. Yes. More the better. Green or red? <laughs> okay. Blue. You like blue? Yeah. Not the coffee color. <laughs> yeah. I got some E's, D's, and, and blue Gatorade. <laughs> All right. Okay. All right, you guys. Well, thanks for the night. Appreciate it. Hopefully, it was helpful. Uh, uh,